worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This time you're invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection and self-examination. We confess together, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together in the reading of the Psalm of the Day which comes from Psalm chapter 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. We join together and sing in the Kyrie and the Gloria. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture readings. Old Testament reading is found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3, 
verses 1 through 10. The young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is found in Philippians chapter two, verses five through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
We now join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May we see as we join together in singing hymn number 937. we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word this morning, we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would speak peace and comfort to us and encouragement to us through the Holy Gospel this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit would speak words of peace, encouragement, and comfort to them through the hearing of God's word and encourage them to fulfill their vocations. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and the gospel of Jesus for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So I grew up in Texas where it's always hot, especially in the summertime when everybody wants to move. Have you ever noticed that, that when someone that you love or care about wants to move and needs your help, it is the worst possible time of year to do it? 
All right, so when I was a little kid, my mom's best friend, Carolyn, was moving and needed our help. And so the night before, my mom came into my room and asked me, are you excited to help Carolyn move tomorrow? And I said, very wisely, well, if I have to, which was not the answer my mom wanted to hear. Instead of being joyful about this act of service and this act of love, I was instead doing it begrudgingly. So before you judge me really too much, I want to tell you that I have not gotten better at this about helping people move. I still will do it, but I will still not do it with joy. All right? And I learned this when I was older in seminary, and I had a pickup truck, and I was the only one in my friends group that had a pickup truck, which automatically means you are the free help mover for everybody's furniture and everything, whether it's a refrigerator, a giant desk, a couch, whatever it might be, they automatically come to you. And because you're in seminary and they're your brothers in Christ, we're all going to be pastors together, guess what you say? You say, oh joy and thank you Lord for giving me this opportunity to help them. Now you go, I guess if I have to, all right? So... How many of you could relate to that of there's been times in your life where you had to serve somebody, help somebody, love somebody, instead of praising God for the opportunity to use your gifts and abilities that he's blessed you with to help them, you did it begrudgingly. Any show of hands on that one? You just said, if I have to, I'll do it. Well, thankfully, in our gospel reading, we have a much better example than me to point you to. The Virgin Mary is shown this great vision with the angel Gabriel. It's the Christmas story. He shows up and appears to her and says, Mary, God is going to do a miracle in your life and in your body, and you are going to give birth to a son who's going to be the Savior and the King of Israel. And Mary's response, of course, is, well, how can that be? How is that even possible? Because I'm a virgin. And yet, when angel Gabriel explains that nothing is impossible with God, here is Mary's response in verse 38. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. See, a lot of times God asks us to do stuff through other people. Now, he might convict us through the Holy Spirit, guide us through the Holy Spirit, and say, this is how I want you to help people, to love people, to serve people. Other times, it will be through their request. They will come to you and say, I need you to pray for me about this. I need help with this. I need you to serve me in this way. And you have a choice about how to respond. You can respond like I did, selfishly, and just say, well, if I have to, Lord. Or we can follow the example of Mary, where she says, let it be to me according to your word. And I love that phrasing, let it be to me according to your word. I am your servant. What that means is she's saying, I'm your servant, God, so whatever your word would guide me to, however your word would lead me through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm your servant. I'm going to do it. I'm going to love my neighbor in that way. It's a beautiful example. And I love that she says, according to your word, right? God's word guides us in how he has gifted us, how he has equipped us to serve him and his church and others. And it's in all kinds of unique and wonderful ways, right? I've told you so often, I can't sing. My brother has perfect pitch. It's not fair, okay? But he has gifted everybody in different ways to serve his church. And so Mary points us to that example. So when we're wondering, God, how have you gifted me? How have you equipped me to serve your church, to love my neighbor? One of the first things we do is we go to God's word for guidance, just like Mary did. She said, according to the word of the Lord, I'm your servant. However you, Lord, would call me and lead me to serve you, let me be obedient to that in my life. So a few things that I want to point out about how the devil works his way into us to get us to do things begrudgingly or not at all. And the first is to think that I won't make a difference. Anybody ever thought that before? I could do this, or I could help, or I could pray, but I don't know what difference it's going to make in somebody's life. It's not that big of a deal. It's not, it's not world-changing. I mean, there's a difference between giving birth to the Messiah who's going to save the whole world 
and using your truck to help your friends move a refrigerator. Right, y'all? Y'all, y'all see the difference there? Right? So sometimes we go, well, I'm not Mary. God's not calling me to bear the child who's going to be the savior of the universe. He's just called me to pray for my friend. He's just called me to help them move. He's just called me to help give them some food in their time of need. He's just helped me to do this or that, right? And so the devil gets in and thinks he wants you to use that word just. Well, it's just doing this. It's just doing that. What difference will it make? And I want you to see in verse 37, it says, nothing will be impossible with God. So when you think, oh, it's just this or it's just that, what difference will it make? What impact will I have in their lives? God's word says nothing's impossible with God. So if you are serving by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's equipped you, he's gifted you, he's called you and guided you. He said, that's what I want you to do. He says, nothing's impossible with God. And so your act of service makes a huge difference in someone's life and God's plan. It might be a little thing. It might be one link in the chain. But God has said, this is what I want you to do. And the impact you have is bigger than you could probably even see because nothing's impossible with God. The second way that, God, that the devil tries to work against God's plan in our lives to try to convince us to sideline ourselves and to not serve and to not use our gifts is to think that I don't have a gift that's worthwhile. In 1 Peter chapter four, the apostle Peter writes, as each has received a gift, So as each one has received a gift, which is a way of saying everybody's received a gift. Everybody's been equipped and shaped and created by God in certain ways to serve his people in different ways. So the question is not, do I have a gift or not? The question is, how has God gifted and equipped me for service to his church and to love my neighbor? And Peter goes on, he says, as each has received a gift... Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I love that phrase in varied grace. It means he has gifted us and equipped us in all kinds of different beautiful ways that all go to work together like a puzzle to e- work together to form the church, to equip us to serve one another for his glory. So we want to be good stewards. So the question is not that whether or not I have a vocation, that I have a gift from God. It is how well am I using it for his glory? Because the answer is you have gifts. God has very, his very grace gifted you and equipped you to serve his church by loving your neighbor. And Galatians says all that matters now is faith expressing itself in love. And so how are we expressing our faith through acts of love and service to our neighbors with the gifts that God has given to you and each and every single one of us? Peter goes on in 1 Peter chapter 4, he goes, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. See, our acts of service, our acts of loving our neighbor are not about us, which sounds a little weird because you're going, well, it's my gift that God has given me, and it's my act of service, so of course it's about me. And Peter's saying, no, it's actually about your neighbor, and it's about glorifying God. In Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, let your light shine before men, let your good work shine before men so that they may see your good works and praise your heavenly Father. And so again, it's not about us. It's not about people looking at you and me and going, wow, look how amazing they are. Look how awesome they are. It's about them seeing our good works, our acts of love and going, wow, they have an amazing Jesus. That's what Peter is saying when he says, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The other word of encouragement I would give to you from Peter's writing in chapter four is he says, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Anybody ever needed a nap? Like a really good power nap? Yeah. It's not just true physically, but it's also true spiritually. We can get worn out by doing good. That's why Paul in Galatians says, don't grow weary in doing good to one another, because what's the danger? We're going to grow weary and get worn out and tired and give up. And Peter says, well, you're not doing those good things out of your own strength. You're doing it out of the strength of God, the Holy Spirit working in you, the same God that has um, 
given you that gift and empowered you is the same Holy Spirit that strengthens you and empowers you to keep on serving him and serving your neighbor. So we do it by not our own strength, right? So on Thursday mornings, we're going through the book of Galatians with our small group Bible study. And one of the things in Galatians is the fruit of the Spirit. What I had to remind everybody is that the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of you. Because what happens is people take that beautiful list of the fruit of spirit, patience, kindness, goodness, mercy, love, and, all, and faithfulness, and all these self-control, and all these wonderful things that Paul lists off, and they turn it into a to-do list. Anybody like to-do lists? How many of you are addicted to your checklist? Like, I've got to make a list, I'm going to check everything off, and I will feel accomplished. All right? Well, Paul doesn't say it's the fruit of your checklist. It's the fruit of the spirit working in your life that produces kindness and love and patience and self-control and, and so many other things. And so Peter is saying it is the Holy Spirit at work in you that empowers you and strengthens you. So a good thing to do when you are tired and worn out or feeling a little exhausted is to take a nap by praying. Right, the Gospels are filled with accounts of Jesus going off on his own to pray and rest. So, dear friends, if Jesus needed to pray and rest, guess what you need to do? You might need to pray and rest, because I'm, I'm pretty sure Jesus is better than you. I love you, but Jesus is better than you, and he's better than me. So if he needed to pray and rest, we can pray and rest, so we can go to God and say, you know, God, I know you've equipped me, and I know you've shaped me and empowered me to do these things and love my neighbor, but it's really hard right now. I'm really tired. That's a prayer. You can bring it to God and say, I need an extra portion of your grace today. I need your Holy Spirit in me today to empower me, to strengthen me, to keep serving, to keep loving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul reiterates what Peter has written. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we are called to serve, we are equipped to serve by the Holy Spirit, not for ourselves, but for the common good. So whatever your gift is, the Holy Spirit has given it to you on purpose, not on accident. That's what Paul and Peter teach. But the other thing that they teach is that it's not just for you to keep it to yourself. Right? Oh, God equipped me and he's empowered me and he's strengthened me to do this kind of thing. But you know what? I don't feel like doing it, so I'm not going to. No, he's equipped you and empowered you for the common good, for the good of your neighbor, for the good of the church. So you need to pray and think and reflect on God's word. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or Romans 12 or Ephesians 4, Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. You can start there and pray and ask God to show you how have you equipped me, how have you shaped me, how have you created me to serve and love your church and my neighbors. Because he has done it. And he's done it for the common good. Now, here's the deal. As wonderful as the example as Mary is, as powerful as these passages from Peter and Paul are that we are reminded God, the Holy Spirit, has equipped you. He has empowered you for service. It all depends on Jesus. Right? Peter says, the strength that God supplies. In Mark chapter 10, the disciples have an argument about who the best disciple is. It's the second time they've done this, right? At a certain point, you think these guys would figure it out that the best one is Jesus. But they keep going back and forth about who the best follower of Jesus is. And at the end of Mark chapter 10, James and John have a secret meeting with Jesus without the other apostles. And then their secret meeting, they ask Jesus, will you let us sit at your right hand and your left hand in heaven? Which is basically saying, will you give us the best seats in heaven because we are better than who? Everybody else. Could you imagine? Jesus is there and one of your friends walks up to him and has a, kind of glances back at you to make sure you're not eavesdropping and is whispering to Jesus, Jesus, I'm so much better than them. Could you, could you give me the right hand or the left hand in heaven? What would your reaction be? You'd be like, who are you? Right? 
let's be honest, none of us would receive that well. And in fact, in Mark chapter 10, the, apostles, the other apostles end up overhearing the conversation and they realize what's being asked and they get angry. And it's an argument of over who deserves and who's better. And Jesus looks at them in this moment when they're arguing about who's the better follower of Jesus. And he says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Read it again. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So in this chaotic moment, when the disciples are wondering who's the best, who's going to get the greatest reward, Jesus says, you're missing the whole point. I didn't come to be served. And Jesus, by the way, is the one who deserves what the most? To be served, to be praised and worshiped. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And here's how I came to serve you, to be the greatest servant of all by giving my life as a ransom for many, by giving my life for you on the cross. This is why in Philippians chapter 2, St. Paul writes, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's saying, I want you to be servants. I want you to have the mind of a servant amongst yourselves in the church that we should have the attitude of, I don't want to be the one that is served. I don't want to be the one that is praised. I want to be the one that is serving like Jesus did. That's what Paul is saying. I want you to have that mindset in the church and your love for your neighbor. You should be asking the question, how can I love people better? And so he says, this is your mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So it's only because of what Jesus has done for us through the cross that you and I even have an inkling of wanting to serve others. In 1 John, the apostle John says, we love because he first loved us which is a very famous verse that people mostly know. I bet many of you already knew it. But we forget it so often. No, I love and I'm able to love others because Christ Jesus loved me with a perfect love first by going to the cross. Another way of saying it is I'm serving because Jesus served me first by going to the cross. So Paul continues in Philippians chapter 2. He says, Who, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Right, Jesus sees the cross before him. And he knows what it's going to cost to redeem you, to forgive you, and to save you. And he doesn't do it begrudgingly. He doesn't do it by saying, well, if I have to. In fact, Hebrews says he did it with the joy set before him. He endured the cross. And the joy was redeeming you and making you his forever through the forgiveness of sins and by his grace. See, you and I are called to be servants of God like Mary, to say, let it be to me according to the word of the Lord. Here I am, I am your servant. Not because we're trying to show the world how awesome we are, but to show the world how awesome our Jesus is. And not to save ourselves, but to show that we have the ultimate servant who saved us by going to the cross to die for us and to forgive our sins. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the greatest servant of all and that through your obedience, you went to the cross to forgive our sins, to die in our place and to give to us your grace and salvation so that we may be redeemed and live with you forever. May we follow in your example and the example of Mary to be servants of God according to his word and how he has called us and equipped us so that more people will know your love and praise our Father in heaven. Amen. This time in the service, I invite the family and sponsors of Joshua Wesley Samuel to come forward for his baptism. He's got a bow tie on if you haven't seen it, and it looks awesome. I just get to wear a robe.
right, if you two would come up here and stand over right here by the font. We can have the sponsors over there. Come up the steps if you can. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. The word of God also teaches us that we are all conceived and born sinful and under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to atone for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. How is the child to be named? Joshua Wesley Samuel, receive the sign of the Holy Cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, according to your strict judgment, you condemned the unbelieving world through the flood. Yet according to your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea, yet led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism in the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold Joshua according to your boundless mercy and bless him with true faith in the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in him which has been inherited from Adam would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, being separated from the multitude of unbelievers and serving your name at all times with a fervent spirit and a joyful hope, so that with all believers in your promise, he would be declared worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From ancient times, the church has observed the custom of appointing sponsors for baptismal candidates and catechumens. In the Evangelical Lutheran Church, sponsors are to confess the faith expressed in the Apostles' Creed and taught in the small catechism. They are, whenever possible, to witness the baptism of those they sponsor. They are to pray for them, support them in their ongoing instruction, and nurture in the Christian faith, and encourage them toward the faithful reception of the Lord's Supper. They are at all times to be examples to them of the holy life of faith in Christ and love for a neighbor. As sponsors, is it your intention to serve Joshua as sponsors in the Christian faith? If so, say yes with the help of God. May God enable you both to will and to do this faithful and loving work with his grace and fulfill what you are unable to do. Amen. Hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. They brought young children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Amen. Since Joshua is too young to speak for himself, the parents and sponsors will answer these questions on his behalf. Do you renounce the devil? If so, say, yes, I renounce him. Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? If so, say, yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? If so, say, yes, I renounce them. Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? If so, say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. If so, say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? If so, say, yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. 
as parents of Joshua, do you desire to, him to receive a Christian baptism? If so, say yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay, bring him over. And we'll... Joshua, Wesley, Samuel, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthening you with his grace to everlasting life. Amen. Receive this white garment to show that you have been clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness that covers all your sin, so you shall stand without fear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the inheritance prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jerry, if you could light the candle for me. Receive this burning light to show that you have received Christ who is the light of the world. Live always in the light of Christ and be ever watchful for his coming, that you may meet him with joy and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb of his kingdom, which shall have no end. In holy baptism, God the Father has made you a member, Joshua, of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with all of us, his treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian apostolic church. We receive you in the name of Jesus as our brother in Christ, that together we might hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you graciously preserve and enlarge your family and have granted Joshua the new birth and holy baptism and made him a member of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We have... We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would keep him in his baptismal grace, that according to your good pleasure, he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of your holy name, and finally with all your saints, obtain the promised inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you welcome Joshua into the house of the Lord? You can go back to your seats now. As they return to your, their seats, I invite the congregation to stand for the prayers of the church. Mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, look with mercy upon us, your children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen us by your spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. In your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, praying from them at all times, thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Grant us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings. Thank you. 
invite the congregation to stand as we continue our worship with the Litany of Mites. And the angel said to her, Mary, <clears throat> do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Mary's response to this call was very simple. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. LWML Sunday calls us again to honor our God, to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, <clears throat> and to serve the Lord, okay, our Lord with gladness, as Mary did. In fervent gratitude for the Savior's dying love and his blood-bought gift of redemption, we dedicate ourselves to him with all that we are and have. As redeemed children of God, Lutheran Women in Mission, give thanks for the opportunity to serve others as we have been served, to proclaim that Jesus is our Lord and that he came for all nations and the chance to respond with our might offerings to support God's mission. Our example has been the widow and her might. The offering she made was observed by our Lord, leading him to share that her copper coins her mites were everything she had, all she had to live on. May our mite offering be blessed for our Lord's kingdom. O oh Lord, O oh Christ, O oh Lord. Mary was chosen to be the mother of a child to be named Jesus, who would save all people from their sins. Mary, for you have found favor with God, and you shall call his name Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Mary's response of willingness to serve was a response of faith and trust. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. The psalmist proclaimed that we are to de <clears throat> declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. Help us, O oh Lord, to proclaim your glory and to proclaim that you are the Christ. Help us. Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Help us to encourage our mission efforts and missionaries with our prayers and our might offerings. The writer of Hebrews stated, how, now may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Help us, dear Lord, and equip all of us, women, men, and children, to engage in your mission and our congregation's work. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Help us to remember our church workers in their ministry and also the service that is given through our Lutheran women of mission. Serve the Lord with gladness. Help our response to be one of joy and love as Jesus loved us and came to serve us. Help us. Gabriel reminded Mary, for nothing will be impossible with God. Help us in our faith, believe that all things are possible because our Lord is God. Mary was ready to serve her Lord. May we be ready and willing to serve our Lord with gladness. May our good Lord guide and direct us in fervent gratitude for the Savior's dying love and his blood-bought gift of redemption we dedicate ourselves to him with all that we are and have. And in obedience to his call for workers in the harvest fields, we pledge him our willing service wherever and whenever he has need of us. We consecrate to our Savior our hands to work for him, our feet to go on his errands, our voice to sing his praises, our lips to proclaim his redeeming love, our silver and our gold to extend his kingdom, 
our will to do his will, and every power of our life to the great task of bringing the lost and the erring into eternal fellowship with him. Amen. O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
invite you to stand for the communion blessing. It is true, body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve in your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us to this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm about to cry. Um, there is a letter available for you. I can't read it. It's, Paul will be handing it out at the back. Um, I informed spiritual care and leadership team this week that I have accepted the divine call to be an associate pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church. Um, I love you all. I thank you for all your love and the joy of being your pastor. Um, Lou has an announcement for the congregation because that's about all I can get out right now. So first of all, um, I'm sure that's not uh, what all of us were hoping to hear, but we've all been praying for you, Pastor, and uh, we're sure that God has answered prayers and, and is doing that which is best for you and for his kingdom here on earth. Uh, Luke Allen, our president, couldn't be here today. Uh, he asked me to just give a brief message. He's, he's been in touch with Pastor Panzer, who is our uh, district Kansas District President, and he and Dr. Uh, Pastor Panzer have arranged a meeting with our congregation on Monday, October the 14th at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Monday, October the 14th, that'd be a week from tomorrow. So I encourage you all to continue to pray for Pastor Mark and for Lauren, pray for Pastor Panzer, and pray for us, give us strength and uh, courage to go through this transition according to your holy plan. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.